Hey, Angela. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm okay, thank you. And yourself? Very well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Such a oh. pleasure to meet you, virtually at least. <laughs> it's very nice to meet you too, and thank you for the invitation. It's really appreciated. It's a pleasure. So you're based in Canada, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's your average? So to come on on a Sunday, so what's your average weekend? You must be like a busy bee as well, you know, like seven days a week. Yeah, actually, the days kind of do fuse one into the other. That's true. Um, yeah, so today today um, was an interesting day. I was doing a little bit of administration, which we all have to do every now and again. <laughs> so I was doing that this morning and uh, in preparation for our meeting later. So, yeah. It's, it's Edmund is the worst. Like, I hate administration. I hate admin. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. No, but you got to do it, right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, uh, like uh, one of the guests I had in July, she was like, she needs to like allocate one day a month just for admin. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know, like you can't do it every day, especially like as a creative, you know, whether you be a musician or author. So just allocate one day and yes. get all your admin done. You yes. Know? Especially like from her point of view, because it came to like, you know, each time she was releasing music, you know, there's like contractual obligations that needs to get sorted out, especially with her mm -hmm. team and her, and of course, you know, all the PRO registrations and so on. So she just allocates that day. So I guess we all hate it some way. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it's really necessary. Like it. I mean, it keeps you sorted and it keeps you organized. So there's really not much <laughs> you can do. I mean. And if you look yeah. at it as a necessary thing as part of it, then it's really not such a bad thing. You know that it's toward moving toward the common good of what you're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, true. I guess without it, you don't have no direction or you don't know what's really going on in your life. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway. Okay, so I mean... Um, you know, we got an hour or so. So I guess, you know, what I love to do with guests first, you know, before I get to like the core points, like just to go back to day one, like how did it all start for you? Uh, you know, did it start as a musician first, as an author first? If it was as a musician, how did it like come to be? How do you know oh, like this was that's, for you? That's a terrific because question. I, yeah, because yeah. I was listening, uh, actually today I was listening to your music and you got such a high, powerful voice. And the first thing that comes to mind is like, okay, were you in a choir? Um, did you do opera before? Like, where did it all start for you and how did it unfold? <laughs> okay, my, my, my journey is a little bit different than most musicians. Um, so I actually, I think the best way to, to describe it is I sang by myself, very uh, uh, sort, of, sort of not really with others and uh, because I was led to believe that I didn't sound any good. And this happened when I was very young. So what happened was um, our, I, the first year, uh, I was six years old, the first year of school, because we didn't have kindergarten in those days. And so it was a brand new school as well. And so they decided that they were going to start a choir. And so they auditioned all the children, but I had no idea what was expected. So I remember walking down this long hallway and going into the auditorium which served as the gymnasium as well. And uh, there was this intimidating, from my six-year-old self's point of view, lady standing there, and she blew into a little device, which I learned later was a recorder. <laughs> but uh, she asked me to replicate the sounds that I heard, and I had no idea what she wanted to do. <laughs> so I just made some really silly sounds. And uh, her, her, I still remember the shock she had on her face. And her words were very clear. She says, oh, I'm so sorry, dear. Um, you can't be in the choir. You can't sing. And I said, okay, that's fine. I can't sing. So I went back to the classroom. And at the end of the day, when I got home off the school bus, um, my mom said, how was your day? And I said, well, this is what happened. And uh, this teacher says, I can't sing. And my mom said, well, that's all right. I can't sing either. So don't worry about it. <laughs> But your grandmother could, but but it's okay if you can't. So I said, all right, that's fine. But the thing is, Kino, I liked singing. <laughs> and one of the advantages, one of the advantages of being growing up in a rural area is I would just go in the forest and I would sing there. 
And it gave me a lot of pleasure. And I thought, well, even if I don't sound any good, it feels good. And so I just did that every day I could. I just went in the forest and entertained, obviously, the animals and um, probably. And I always figured, well, you know what? No one can hear me here, except that the silly part of it is years later, I heard from the neighbors. We all could hear you, Angela. And it was nice. <laughs> So fast forward a little bit, um, when um, after my husband and I sold our company, um, which is about 11 years ago, um, I said, I'm going to take formal singing lessons now. And so I met a lovely person by the name of Mark Dubois, who is a lyric tenor, and he trained me in opera. And um, because my voice has a lot of operatic qualities to it, and so that was what we focused on. Although I must admit, I was interested in singing in other styles as well. And so we did that for a number of years. And then, of course, the pandemic was sandwiched in between all of that. But I just continued to sing on my own, which I've done my whole life. And um, so then I found another beautiful um, instructor by the name of Cynthia Fox Fuchile. And she's a mezzo-soprano. And so I really enjoy training with her. She was an awesome teacher as well, a wonderful vocal coach. And I really wanted to fulfill a lifelong dream, was, which was to produce an album. And so I worked with Cynthia and I worked with another gentleman from that studio, which is called Hit That Note. And um, he, has a stu he has a recording studio called the Red Egg Studio. And so last year we worked on producing my album. And because I really love Celtic music, I wanted to have a number of songs on the album that focused on Celtic music. But I also wanted to feature three original songs um, that are a result of my poetry, because the other part of what you asked me earlier is what started writing or singing. I've always been writing poetry. So three of my poems were adapted to songs which are on the album as well. So my evolution is a little bit different than a lot of artists because although I've always been singing, it was a very private thing for me. And it took a number yeah. of years to go on stage and sing. And I love performing and I do for charity um, locally around here when I can. And so that's my journey. So it's a bit different than most artists. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So like with your poetry, um, what was it something that was also something like some sort of a like passion for you or something that you went out to do professionally? Um, always a passion. So with the poetry, I found out early on that poetry was a wonderful way of expressing myself. I was rather shy when I was a kid, which again is probably why they told me I couldn't sing and I believed them. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, if that's what you say, that must be true. It's like, um, sort of saying, like, it's the shy ones that always shine at the end, you know? Oh, maybe so. That's very sweet. Maybe that's true. Yeah. So, um, so I found that if there was something troubling me or if I love something in nature, because as I explained, I was always in the forest and always in nature, I found that poetry was a really wonderful way of expressing what I felt or what I saw. And um, so I've always been writing from that perspective. And there was one story that I wanna share with you, which underlined to me early on the importance and the power of words. And I grew up in a really lovely environment uh, with my parents, beautiful people, but all of us, we have our faults and all of us will argue yeah. from time to time. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, my parents were having an argument and it was unusual for them to do so. And it, it sounded so bitter and so unhappy and I didn't know what to do. And so I remember climbing upstairs to my, to my room and I went to my desk and I wrote a poem called Dawn is not long now. And um, when it seemed quiet, I went downstairs and my parents were sitting there talking quietly with each other. And I handed them this poem. And when they read the poem, they both had tears in their eyes. And, and it, that showed me how important it is to communicate and how the beauty of words can 
um, change of state, change of mental state can cause, cause you to feel calmer. And so that was an important lesson that I learned at 10 years of age. And so that has always left me then with a the feeling that when I really am troubled or happy or just have something to convey, poetry for me is, is the most uh, important avenue to express myself. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, there's poetry for some people. Some people love to write like me, like for me to express myself and to get what's inside or what's going on inside, outside, you mm -hmm. know, it's writing. Um, I know people who love to draw, you know, as soon as it comes to the mind, they want to draw it. That's expressing themselves and releasing any sort of like anxiety or depression that may be going on inside. You know, it's drawing. It's so important. Like even if you're not an artist or for me, I feel, okay, you get artists, but everyone in life is an artist themselves. You're the artist of your life. So yeah. you need to find some channel or means to express yourself. And by just letting that, you know, whatever's inside, that input is out. Yeah. You know, it's going to do so much wonders for you. Oh, wow. I love an artist of your life. That is so beautiful. I can almost think of some poems that would be so yeah. beautiful to accompany those words. I love that expression. Very nice. Um, and yes, we are authors of what we do in our lives. And and I truly believe that there is something artistic in all of us. It just needs to be encouraged and it needs to be nurtured. And um, and some of us don't get nurtured and, and give up right away. And others continue on like me singing anyhow because it just felt good. It just made me into this beautiful Um, yeah, I think we, we yeah, we're getting, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go. Oh, sh oh she went off. Should I come back in? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know can, you back can, on now. Are we you connected? Oh my God. Uh, wow. So did you I could hear it, you and I and you're you're quite clear visibly. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was what just happened. like freezing, freezing, freezing. Um, then you went off and then you came back in. Okay, but anyway, oh, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. So did you hear my answer? Uh, you, or, were, um, uh, you were just getting into after you know what. The author of your life and then it started to like oh yes i think yeah, that's yeah, beautiful yeah. and I, yes and so what i was saying and i don't know if i'm repeating myself or not but um what i was saying that's is true. that we all have that artistic ability right we all yeah, have that yeah. in us and sometimes we're nurtured and sometimes we're not and even those of us who are not nurtured sometimes it comes out anyway because it just feels so good so i think we all need to tap into that definitely yeah, you know, I'm going to be like controversial on the topic as well. It's just that, you know, as the generations unfolded, we were never taught to express ourselves and be creators of our own destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, we were never. Like, even if you, like, you went to school, you were never taught or, you know, or given a manual or a textbook, you know, on how to express yourself and be the artist of your life. It never was done. So it becomes, it becomes difficult for some people especially when you get so caught up in your day-to-day -day and how life is, how life was. Mm -hmm. um, but it creates a lot of unhappiness in the world. You know, it creates a lot of happiness if you don't tap into your true self. 
That's right. It does. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, and, it I, does. and I think you're I think you're absolutely right about the lack of encouragement. And I think that what I'm observing nowadays is that there is more encouragement now, but for me growing up, you know, if if someone said you can't sing, I took that as verbatim, right? I took that as absolutely the truth. And yeah. they, except for maybe being an art class, because I used to draw and paint an awful lot when I was younger. Um, that was really the only avenue that you had in school to express yourself. And not everybody um, is comfortable doing that. And so I felt being a little bit of an introvert and shy, drawing and writing poetry was my way to express myself. But that was really done except for the except for the the art classes the poetry was really something i did at home and was encouraged at home by that so i had good family for that but in the school system i think you're absolutely right that i believe that's different now yeah no it's changing because i mean now you know we don't have to depend on the traditional education system any longer mm -hmm. you know now you can educate yourself online you know, exhibit day will be now us on this podcast. You tune into the podcast, you know, you hear what Angela or Kino has to say about a specific topic. Boom. It's hard for people to digest, especially parents uh, these days. It takes a lot of convincing. Um, but sooner we do get there, you know, sooner or later. Like I even look at my own parents who like, I remember when I first came out and I said, you know, because I start off as a DJ and I'm like, no, I love to DJ. I love music. And then I worked my way you know, up the ladder, and then I went into music production. They never see it as, you know, a means of income or never see it as a legit or proper career until I actually proved it to them. And I started to convince them and share stuff with them. Then they finally got it. Look, okay, cool, you know, now we're going to support you with it. Um, but these days, you know, it, there's still a lot of convincing that needs to take place, you know, because we're so dependent. Like, if you have some sort of let's just say mental illness, for example, the traditional method is, okay, no, we need to send you to a psychiatrist who's learning mm -hmm. from a textbook that was written who knows how many years ago. But, you know, there's so many different avenues right now. You just need to like, really understand the person that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. you, know, to find out because, you know, you're going to take this wrong path um, and then it's just going to cause you more havoc along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, more havoc along the way. Yeah, we're, we're all individuals, and so therefore the approach on how we learn, how we absorb, how we express ourselves is going to be different. And cookie-cutter type of approaches just don't work. And yeah. you're right, there are so many possibilities with what's available online for learning that nowadays there's, there's so much more that we can absorb. Um, I almost worry sometimes because there's so much, like how can you absorb it all? And you're not meant to, obviously. We're not machines. Yeah. But but it is good that we can recognize now that there is so much more available and that we're not all the same and that we're all individuals. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess one word that always comes up on uh, the show is there's so much more awareness now in the world. You know, People are more conscious now in the world. And um, just like we just have to like filter it down, even though it's still a lot of convincing, at least, you know, in my part of the world. But, you know, you filter it down, you know, people need to understand, you know, the true essence of life and what life actually is and how yeah. we've been blindfolded to what the yeah. truth actually is. And as you said, you know, how we all so unique and we all so special and we all got specific gifts and specific talents, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just about identity, more awareness, awareness. And wouldn't it be nice if that level of awareness was raised even higher so that we would stop the wars, we would stop the conflicts and just stand back and say, I see you as a person and I appreciate you rather than these barriers because we still have so many barriers. Um, but if that level of awareness, that energy could be raised up higher, Oh gosh, that would be an amazing world then, and and more recognition of the plight of animals too. Like just just that awareness, it would be so nice to see it raised even higher. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. So you into so with your charity work, um, where's it focused? Is it focused uh, with oh, like humans or animals? Yeah. Both? 
Yeah, actually, I do have my main focus is an organization. I'm one of the directors and it's a wildlife rehabilitation center. It's called Procyon Wildlife Rehabilitation and Education Center. And so there's two components. The first component is that we uh, rescue injured or orphaned wildlife, and then we heal them or raise them if they're orphans and then release them back to the wilds. So that's the first component of the work that we do. The second part is education. So again, going back to that awareness, this is a nice segue into that. So awareness of the of, of what to do when you see an animal that's in trouble, awareness about their plight, because there's a lot of construction going on across the world, I think, but certainly in my, in my neck of the woods. And so we're losing habitat for this wildlife. They're being displaced. And so people are interacting more with wildlife than they used to because we're, they're occupying uh, an area which was maybe a year or two before was meadow or, or a forest, and now it's housing, right? So um, those animals have been displaced. So we like to have that education component about what we do at Procyon Wildlife as well. That is very rewarding work. I am in awe of the volunteers who do the animal care. I'm more involved in the administration and where I manage their website and, and, um, and graphic artwork and some of the other administrative things that are involved in running the center, but it's a very rewarding thing to see these animals healed or raised from being an orphan into strong, smart, funny little things that get uh, released into the wild. Yeah, yeah, and how long have you been doing it? Um, I've been with Procyon since 2016, so about eight wow. years. Yeah. it's a long time, yeah, 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 yeah. So do you guys just focus like, um like locally, or do you have like an international mandate? Uh, no, we have a local mandate. Um, basically, we are governed by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, which is called the MNRF in Ontario. So basically, our focus is Ontario. There are other rehabilitation centers within Ontario, which is important. They're needed. Our area is pretty vast, though. We probably cover about a 100 kilometer radius. Um, from where the center is in helping animals in need. Wow. Okay. Big ups to you. Big ups to you. Thank you. You know, standing up for, um, you know, species that can't defend themselves. Unless they bite you, you know. <laughs> well, they can't speak for themselves. You know? <laughs> they bite you, it's because you've aggravated them, likely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, we look at, uh, you know, we look at wild species and we think, oh no i'm scared you know they're gonna kill me but if you if you don't harm them you know okay i'm not guarantee you it's not gonna harm you but if you don't harm them you're good you know yeah, yeah it's and then, you know like a, yeah. yeah and i mean animals can at times have like a smarter sense than humans and they sort of like sense like spiritually are you a good person or not so mm -hmm. if i'm gonna attack you because i know you have a dirty heart and you have bad intentions towards me now mm -hmm. you know so humans need to understand that part as well. You know, it works both ways. Yes, it's it like, does. It does. Yeah, it's like, definitely. Like even even with our domestic pets, like um, we had some workers come into our house not too long ago, and our cat, who's usually pretty sociable, he did not like these people. I don't know what was wrong, but he did not like them. And yet the next day we had some other workers in to do some other uh, things for us, and he liked them. So you're yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Animals, whether wild or domestic, do have a sense of with, whether you mean them harm or not. But really, with, with respect to wildlife, the best approach is always to just respect and stay away. Don't try to get those crazy photo ops that you see some people sometimes trying to do. Respect their space, respect their habitat, and don't interact with them because they, they, um, they deserve that peace. They deserve that sanctity of their own space. Yeah. So what's like the most, uh, let's use the word dangerous species you've ever come across? Well, they all can be dangerous if, if uh, aggravated. Um, so or... in, the case, in the case of Ontario, um, sometimes we'll encounter raccoons who have distemper. Um, that's not good. 
but any animal that's cornered can become dangerous in seconds. And so yeah. um, our volunteers have specific ways of, of restraining an animal if the animal is sick. For example, we've been getting a lot of beautiful foxes that have mange. And that's a sort of a, um, a mite that burrows under the skin. And eventually um, it can cause death to these animals if it's not treated. However, fortunately, if we can capture the foxes, or it also will happen with coyote, um, those are the two common ones we usually see. Um, they can be fully they can be fully recovered in about six weeks with treatment by us at the center. But obviously, when you have an animal that's sick and frightened, they're going to be dangerous. That's a given. So I can't see one is more um, dangerous than the other. In in certain circumstances, you can get bitten, and so. Our volunteers are trained um, very well um, in handling any animals that that need help that way. And so it, it cuts down the, the exposure and the danger. If you know what you're doing, then it's a pretty safe process. They were actually nice. having a seminar just yesterday for our advanced volunteers on how to safely restrain an animal. So, you know, these are things that are ongoing parts of our education as well for our volunteers, too. Interesting, interesting. You know, just to conclude this topic, you know, like cats, when you mention cats, if you look at the history of cats, you know, we follow roots like back to Egypt and cats are like spiritual creatures. So mm -hmm. they pick up on something, they know something that we don't. So mm -hmm. it's a good animal to have around. <clears throat> you know? oh, As you said, you know, a friendly, sociable cat can hate one person or dislike one person and then the next oh, person yeah. that comes, you know, oh, we're all friendly, we're cool, we're friends now, you know. They pick Absolutely. it up. Absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, he was so upset. I wasn't home at the time. He was so upset. He went to my husband and meowed, like actually trying to tout him. <laughs> and this is a very verbal cat. He talks a lot all the time. But you could, but, he, but it was very clear that he was quite upset and he was saying, I don't like it. I'm uncomfortable. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what is uh, what's his name or her name? Um, his name is Mr. Tommy, and Mr. Yeah. Tommy is 19 years old. Okay, Mr. Tommy sounds like a cool dude. He is a cool <laughs> dude. <laughs> like a cool call dude. Him Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about David Harris and your uh -huh. book. Yes. Like, so, you know, I read the description about the book. So how did this storyline come about? It's like, you know, just reading the description is like, you know, watching a movie now. Uh, I'm thinking, sure. Like, how did you come up with like, you know, with this concept of somebody concept. now getting a fact? Which is true. I mean, what you're saying is true. You're like, I mean, uh, not sure whether your book is sold as fiction or nonfiction. But this is like a reality of, you know, being a human, of like having certain you know, deja vus from our past life, mm -hmm. you know, that affect us. This is so deep. This is a deep topic. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's clear from your point now, like, how did it come? My, <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite topics, actually. And so, again, I'm going to go back to my childhood for just a brief moment. So yeah. um, I grew up in a unique environment where my mom and dad, um, they were moderately psychic more healing in the part of my dad. And my mom had a little bit ability, but it was muted. But they had a lot of friends. They would go to spiritual um, gatherings and they had a lot of friends who were very psychic. And they befriended a number of them. They just hit it off. And so two, two that would visit us most often were Rosemary and Josh. And so subjects around our dinner table would be about reincarnation, about different aspects of mediumship. So I was exposed to this concept from a very early age, and I'm very used to the idea of reincarnation, and I do believe in it. Um, and I think that a lot of the skills that you see someone who is who's a genius, and it, whether it's music or art or, or mathematics or science, and I think that that has to be coming from past life. the accumulation of knowledge that has happened over a number of lifetimes. That's what I think. But so in my early 20s, I had the idea that maybe I would transition from writing poetry 
to writing a book. And I must admit, I had this idea then and I abandoned it because I got busy. You mentioned about how you get busy with work and life. And so I put that manuscript aside. It was about a third of the way done and I put it to the side and um, didn't think much about it. But the idea had always been, what if someone was murdered? What if they reincarnated right away? And early enough then that the killer may still be alive. And that's a topic that I always was playing around with in my mind. Um, about two years ago, I came across the manuscript in December of 022. And I thought, cleaning out my drawers, I thought, should I get rid of this? And I thought, well, let's look at it this time. Because usually I would just stuff it back in the drawer. And I started to read it and I thought, well, I want to modernize a lot of the technology that we have available nowadays. I think that will give it a more uh, contemporary feel and um, more realistic for today's time. And I really thought, you know what, there's a lot I need to rewrite, but I really like the premise of this story. So the protagonist, David Harris, he is having nightmares and he's had them since childhood. And Nobody can figure out why he has these kind of dreams. His parents have sought help from traditional medicine, from psychiatrists, psychologists, and nothing's helped. And um, they're pretty debilitating. They do go away for a while during his um, mid-20s. But then as he gets to approaching the age of 30, the dreams are coming back and they're even worse than ever. And he can't really quite sort it out. Um, by happenstance, or not so much, I think it's fate, he meets a young lady by the name of Emma Jackson. And Emma Jackson is a psychic who's, she's developing her skills. And as they get to know each other, she realizes that these dreams he's having, she actually has a shared dream experience with him, a vision. And um, she realizes these are likely memories and not uh, something that's stemming from childhood trauma, which is what all the medical experts have been saying. So she convinces David to have a past life regression. And during the, a series of regressions, it is discovered that he indeed was murdered and he did reincarnate so soon that his killer, after they do a little bit of, of uh, quick work on the internet, they realize the circumstances of his death and they realize the killer is still alive after a bit of sleuthing on their parts. And so from there, the story shifts from, from you know, solving, like Emma had hoped just finding out what had happened would be enough closure for him. But now that he realizes the killer is still alive, now he has this burning desire to find justice because David is a lawyer, so he's well steeped in this sense of justice. And so it switches now to I need to find justice and I don't want this to happen to anyone else. So there's this, there's this sense of making sure the killer does not strike again. So that's the premise of the story. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, for listeners, if you want to find out more, purchase the book, How the Soul Ends for David. <laughs> but I mean, this is this is so true, you know? This is so true. Like from where I'm sitting, I can't even call this sort of scenario or play like fiction you know i just can't that's just my opinion on it mm -hmm. you know there's more deeper meanings to dreams than people actually realize mm -hmm. you know understanding your dreams writing down your dreams you mm -hmm. know researching more why there was a spiritual healer who or whoever about your dreams is so important it's hidden messages how do those hidden messages play a role in your life you know that's for you to find out now and go and research but it's not something that's happening you know just oh no randomly you know, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So, there's, I mean, you, yeah, so you can yeah, continue. There's, you're right. I mean, what you say, I'm loving our conversation um, because this is really true to my heart. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, those dreams, those images, you should write them down because they are messages. Your subconscious is processing, not just what's happened to you during your current lifetime, but I think that, it can be processing or reminding you um, about a situation you may have lived before in order to help um, solve the situations you have in your current life. Because we are the culmination of all ourselves. 
And so what we are today is really the result of the lives we've had before. And so, yes, if you get a glimpse into that, then um, I think it can help you with your day to day life now. Yeah, yeah. So like just on the topic of dreams, and I know um, everyone will have a different process, a different method, you know, on how to actually like dissect it and find out the true meaning behind it. What methods would you like advise, you know, on that after people write down their dreams? Like, what works like, best for a person? Like, like advice on how to interpret their dreams? Yeah. Or yeah. Advice? Well, I think that's very individualistic. And I think the best thing to do is if you've had a dream, immediately write it down. Because, you know, a dream will just disappear into into the air if you don't write it down. By the time you wake up, it's gone. So whether you dictate it into a, 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 a device or whether you have a note paper and pen by your bed, make sure you write it down. And then I think the best way to try and interpret your dreams, I know there's books out there that will help you saying, this symbolism is that, this symbolism could mean this. But I think that if you sit down and you meditate on it, so just take Take some time when it's quiet for you and meditate as about what that dream could have meant and just let your mind sort of be quiet and peaceful. A, a revelation may come to you and it may not be like sitting meditating. In, in, it might be actually thinking on it while you're going for a walk in nature. But whatever you do, try to connect with what that dream might have meant because a friend, you could tell a friend the dream and they may have some insight, but but it, that's not you. You need to try to pull that out of yourself. So I would say do it through meditation, whichever format that might take, by just taking quiet moments and reflecting on what that dream was. And you may even just let it go and not even be thinking about it at all. And then moments later or a little later, you're going to have that aha that's what that dream meant. That's what that imagery meant. I think I understand. So, and maybe you won't. So there may be times it doesn't come. Maybe it comes days later, but there is that element to you, that element for you that you should allow your mind to go free and relax and try and get those thoughts sorted so that it will come to you unbidden. That's the idea anyway. It's so important what you said there, let your mind go free. Probably the hardest thing a human can do, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let your mind go free, you know, mm -hmm. meditate. I guess, you know, uh, like, yeah, for me, you know, sometimes when I have like a dream, you know, you wake up and, you know, I think you write it down or you remember what it is, you know, the next uh, morning. But as you said, you know, the more you just spend time with it and reflect on it, it's sort of like you connect the dot. Mm -hmm. oh, no, this is happening because this happened now in like this conscious state of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and it connects the door and it's giving you like sort of direction. And it's up mm -hmm. for you to instinct also plays a role for me. You know, once again, this is my opinion. Like I can have a dream. I connect it the next morning to something that's been happening in my conscious state of mind. Mm -hmm. And I go on instinct on which direction to actually go with this. Maybe it's right. a decision I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? But my instinct is going to tell me, my heart is going to tell me, oh, no, make yes or no. You know, mm -hmm. after I've connected the dot on, you know, which direction to go. Or it's telling me what to actually do next on a specific topic that I'm confused about. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, um, yo, it, it's uh, the topic is just, it's complex. Eh? It's, it's so complex. Interesting, but also extremely complex. But something that I feel everybody needs to go down the road. You know, you have yes, to go down do. the road. Yeah. And the answers will come. And, and you're absolutely right with everything. Like, we're totally in sync on this, this thought that, the answers do lie with you. Um, yeah. I mean, talking with a friend may help give you clarity, but honestly, those answers lie with you to discover. Yeah, no, no, definitely. So either, you know, doesn't say that like the confusing part is like, you know, is it something like present? Is it something now like David linked to a past life? You know, mm -hmm. where does it, you know, like, what you but I am intrigued, you know, to find out. So where can uh, people purchase the book? Well, Amazon is probably the easiest way. Um, right. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, there are other um, 
online uh, sources to obtain the book, but but on an international level, I think Amazon is probably the simplest and easiest. And you can get it in uh, an ebook format, uh, soft cover and hard cover. And I am currently working on um, making an audio book as well, because I, I think a lot of people enjoy if they're driving, you know, then they can listen to. I love that, too. Like if I'm driving, there's times I'll just put on an audio book. I just enjoy that. So I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. that's an important uh, area that I'm currently working on to have an audio book for past life's revenge as well. Yeah, that's it. I'm more of a physical guy. Like I love to like just sit down, you know, with the book in my hand and like, yeah. Unless it's like, a, you know, an educational book, then like, you know, I can do with Kindle, you know. I make it work with Kindle. It's just like easier and much more cheaper that way. But like when it comes to a book like, you know, Past Lives of Revenge, I would love to like just, you know, hold it. <laughs> you know, hold it. You know, yeah. get into it. Uh, here it is. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Thanks for sharing. Thanks. Thank you. And since so we're talking about my album, there's my album. Oh, well, that's perfect. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> but for someone who was told she can't sing, they were so mistaken at that point in life because your vocals are like, yo, you know? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah I love it. Like, mm -hmm. um, it was it was so nice to be able to i just had this really strong desire to put that music into an album and i'm just so glad i had that opportunity and um yeah i love singing there's just no way i would i'm, I'm glad i didn't give up and i'm glad i didn't listen but my solution was that i just said well if you think i can't then i'll just go in the forest so you can't hear me <laughs> um, yeah they hurt me <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you you had a passion for it. You set a goal. I want to do an album, and you did it. You know, yes, that that's amazing. You know, yeah. set the goal and do it. Don't mm -hmm. worry about what the critics are saying or whoever told you that you can't sing. You know, if that's your goal. That's your passion. Go ahead and do it. Don't do it for anybody else but yourself. That's you know? right. Yeah, ease yourself first. Make yourself happy first before you want to make the world happy. That's right. It's it's yeah. it's the truth. And um, yeah, it's the same thing with that book. I mean, I had toyed with the idea and then I just decided, I must say my husband inspired me a little bit because he released his book, his first book called Outfoxed. And he released that it, in uh, January of 2023. And I think part of that inspiration for me picking it up in December of 022 was the fact that he was ready to launch his book. And I thought, you know what? That's inspirational. I'm proud of my husband. And yeah, I have yeah. a partially written manuscript here. I mean, I should just do it. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so all I did. It. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, you know, as far as relationships is concerned, it's good to find yourself in that sort of relationship where you can all just like inspire each other. Oh, yeah. You know, to chase those goals. Not yeah. be in a relationship where like, you know, oh, I want to write a book, but there's no inspiration. And your partner is telling you, nah. It's not worth it. Why are you going to waste your time? You know, then you're definitely with the wrong person. You know, um, someone is telling you that you're with the wrong person. Yeah. So, what well, is next for Angela? Is it a well, next album? Is it a next book? Is it both? I have several projects on the go. So, um, my, my I have already begun to write the sequel to Past Life's Revenge. This one is going to be called Revenge Is Not Enough. So, I have that revenge. <laughs> David, uh, David and Emma continue to work together now. Um, they are sweethearts, but they do continue to work together. And because David was fulfilled with the fact that he got answers and he got justice. And so Emma and David now are in the position of saying, but there are other cold cases out there. And what if we use the paranormal to try and help solve these cases? keeping in mind that we always need to have law enforcement help us, but if we can at least use the paranormal to point the police in the right direction, and then they can adopt good old sleuthing skills, um, I think that that's sort of the direction I'm going, and that gives me plenty of room 
to write a number of, of books within this series. So that is my goal. I'm about a third of the way through Revenge is Not Enough. And my goal is to have that ready by probably the middle of next year. Um, so that is that is a project. I'm also working on, when I look at all the poetry I've written over the years, there's quite a lot. And so I have been working quite a bit lately on um, a poetry book of, of all my poems, so a compilation of that. And I hope to get that done early in the new year. Um, with respect to an album, I am planning on doing one that's probably a year or two off, but I do want to do another album as well and incorporate more original music. This first album has 11 songs on it, but um, three of them are originals. The rest are traditional Celtic songs, but with really nice interpretations with them, with the studio I worked on, worked with. But um, yeah, so I am planning on all of the above. Uh, so the poetry is the first project um, early this coming year. The next one will be the book mid this coming year. And then probably the following year, I'll be going back into the studio and working on an album project. So those nice, are my goals. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, with, yeah, so it never stops. In between working with Procyon, we have an upcoming fundraising gala, which is coming up uh, on November 23rd. So we can raise funds for the center because we don't get any uh, funding from government. So we have to, to uh, go um, and be creative in raising funds to keep us, us operational. So that keeps me busy. It's a country property that, that keeps me busy, but the artistic aspect of it I is, is always paramount for me. It's very important in my life. Nice. Well, look, you know, you're going to probably get more out of the private sector than government as far as funding is concerned. <laughs> and it's going to be well, less yeah. red tapes anyway. <laughs> you know? Yes, you know? that's absolutely true. <laughs> I mean, past lives revenge, you know, I'm hoping to like in the future to come see like a movie out of this or a series out oh. of this. Yeah, wouldn't you that know? be nice? <laughs> I yeah. think every well, author has yeah. that dream. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you know what, to submit to Netflix, for example, in 2024 is so much more easier than it was, let's just say, 10, 20 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. for an author. You know, you can. Now you can actually just, you know, submit your storyline, submit your book, and hear what they say. But I feel like Past Lives Revenge is, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's definitely no. something that I would love to see, like, you know, online. As a series would be cool, yeah, as well. But I mean, yeah, even a movie. I yeah, I think so. Like, I think a, a series would work, but a movie would would be great too. I mean, anything like that would be absolutely thrilling to see it on the screen. And I think it's yeah. always interesting the interpretation that uh, that screenwriters will will do and directors will do with a written work of art, and their interpretations are always fascinating and how they how they uh, come up with that. So yeah. it would be fascinating what they would do with it. Yeah, I mean, maybe after the sequel is out, you know, something to look into, you know. Yeah, I will think about that. It's a good idea. Yeah, as I said, it's so much more easier these days. Hey, like you know, even guys here based in South Africa who are coming up with like uh, you know different sort of uh, movie ideas or serial ideas. You know, now like I just assist them. Okay, you know, like you can submit now direct to Netflix or whoever, you know. Because we're not, you know, we're not in this era of, you know, just traditional TV anymore. You know, it's all online. Yeah. There's even, um, I forgot what this website is called. I actually signed up for it to test it out. But you can actually on it. Okay, so I mean, okay, you are, you got YouTube. But this is like, you can create like your own TV channel using uh -huh. their hosting services. Oh. You know, like even if you want to do like your own production, you know, mm -hmm. you just do it by yourself, you know. There's yeah. so many avenues, you know, you can actually yeah. go on. Yeah. And I mean, I can also, uh, you know, just before we like we conclude, like I'm working with a psychiatrist, a retired psychiatrist as well, based in the States. So mm -hmm. she's focused on suicide prevention. And we've oh. launched like our own podcast together on the topic itself. It launched last week, Tuesday. And there's like a new, you know, live podcast each Tuesday. But uh, she's also like, you know, talented when it comes to poetry. So what she's done with her poetry 
like focused on suicide prevention and she converted into visual arts and then she created a YouTube channel, YouTube channel out of it. So that's something also cool, you know, you can do with your yeah. poetry. So she hires like freelance uh, singers, vocal, but I mean, you could do it yourself. You're a vocalist. You know, she's not a vocalist, so you could do it yourself. And then she uses this, like, I mean, you know, depending on the topic or what your poem is about, you know, focus, like if it's on animals, focus that, put it online and get that awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure. So that's also quite cool with poetry. Yeah, that's the beauty of poetry because you can say a lot with very succinctly, which is which is what I love. And there are so many powerful messages. Like with the uh, with a poetry book that I'm putting out, I had originally thought I would just sort of go with when I wrote it, you know, just sort of go chronologically. And then I began to realize that wasn't really suitable because I have a number of themes and one of my biggest themes is nature and how Mother Gaia is in danger um, with the expansion and with the way that we are mistreating our world. And so I noticed that I had a theme there. I also had a theme which, which featured around love and other emotions. And so I decided that instead of uh, going chronologically, I would group it by subject by the things that I find the most passionate, which is, which is nature, which is, which is relationships. And also I have another category, which is um, to do with social commentary. And so, um, and I think it's more, it's going to work. It'll flow better for me to present the poetry that way, but you're 100% right. Like poetry is such a great way of conveying um, very in very few words, um, uh, making commentaries on on the things that trouble us in society, that trouble us in the world, um, and our relationships and and suicide. Wow, that's that's a really important topic. And it seems that as much as we want awareness about this subject, it seems as if there still isn't enough. That people suffer so much internally and they don't share. Um, that they're afraid to share what they're feeling. And um, gosh, it would be nice if we could eliminate this tragedy from, from people's lives. So good for yeah. you to create that awareness to the public. Nah, thanks. I mean, look, I mean, the first episode was, you know, just what you said, you know, it's not enough. So we're actually trying to use this platform now to actually close the gap on why isn't it enough? Because if we look at the figures, you know, we're looking at 700,000 worldwide. That's how many lives we lose you know, to suicide. So something yeah. is not working. So now we yeah. have to identify what's not working because, you know, yeah. once again, like how we started off, you know, this conversation is when something is wrong, something may be going on inside with the person. We want to follow the traditional methods, but the traditional methods are not working because if it was working, we wouldn't be here still talking about the topic that there's a problem. Right. You yeah. know, we wouldn't have 700,000 and a number that just keeps going up. We wouldn't have that. So we need to relook really at our methods. We need to relook. Really For me personally, you know, once again, my opinion, the healthcare system is a failure. You yeah. know, whichever component you look at, it's a failure. Yeah. It's not working, especially when yeah. it comes to mental illness. It is not working. If anything, it's making things worse. For a person. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you could go in, they tell you, ah, you crazy, whatever. Yeah, we need to do this, and we need that. But you know, those methods are making you worse. They're making you crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, we'll see how it goes, and uh, you know, we take. But I was, I was actually going to laugh when you were talking about how, you know, poetry is so it's so powerful, right? To express how you're feeling about a specific topic, and I was going to say we've come such a long way since roses are red, violets are blue. <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> a little poetry for us, you know. <laughs> you know, it was like a romantic gesture. That's what poetry was, you know. Growing up, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, write a girl a poem. Yeah, <laughs> it's different now, yeah. and, and I love it. Like I belong to a, a writing group, and uh, anyone interested in writing should always belong to groups that where you can have writing prompts and and share your work with each other. And the people who are writing the poetry, I always find it so interesting because nearly always they um, have um, they have this component which is making a commentary on something that's happening in their lives or in society. 
And I think that that is just really awesome. I think that's important. <laughs> yeah. No, no yeah. doubt, no doubt. So yeah, Angela, thank you so much for coming on and joining me. This was really good. It was interesting for Sunday. This is the first time I've done a podcast on a Sunday. Oh, for so me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, this was cool. disrupt. I'm I'm sorry about last week. I I no, had a, no, it's fine. But uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. It was I really loved our conversation. It was so interesting and and I enjoy these podcasts because you get to meet different people from all over the world and uh, yeah. it shows yeah. our connectivity. It shows it shows how connected we are no matter where we are on this beautiful planet. So that's yeah. it was a real delight to talk with you, Kino. Really nice. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, you know, when it comes to a podcast, you, you know, the universe will bring you into the room with the people that actually have the same intentions as yourself, you know, for the world. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how it always was. I mean, when I started off podcasting, it was, you know, it was here and there and I had guests coming on. But not once can I say I've had a guest that came on where we weren't on the same frequency, ah. you know about life, about society, no matter what it may be. Yes, we all artists in our own right. You know, you're a vocalist, you're a composer. Same year, you know, I'm a producer. But, you know, it's just one part of our lives. There's a bigger purpose there, you know. Yeah. Yours yeah. is now, you know, animals. You're using your art to save animals. You know, that's what it comes down to. It's charitable at the end of the day, mm -hmm. which is so special and so unique. So, yeah, so no, thank you. All the best for your future endeavors and adventures ahead and the sequel. You know, and I'm looking forward to reading your book. I am. Oh, I am. Wonderful. Well, drop me a And watch it online one day. <laughs> I'd love yeah, to know what you think. <laughs> and no, I wish you the very best as well, Kino. I really do. And I really thank treasure you. the conversation. It was lovely. <laughs> It was, it was. Thank you. So I will send uh, you and Mickey the link once it's uploaded and yeah, we take it from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, you enjoy too. Okay. Will you be able to... Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Oh. Question. I just was curious. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, will you be able to splice out the parts that were... Where we lost contact? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is... Uh, yeah, I'm going to play it. I'm going to see exactly what happened because at times... It may freeze like, you know, live while we're recording, but in yeah. the background, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm just going to like play it out and then, you know, save the day. Okay. All right. Yeah. Terrific. But, <laughs> but you know, with me, uh, like, uh, like when it comes when something happens while I'm in this conversation with guests and guests are like, you know, like, you know, you get these podcasters out there that spend like a whole week editing the podcast. I'm like, you know, you know, keep it organic, show people you're human. You know? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, it, uh, those are the best conversations, right? They're just natural and free flowing. Yeah, those are the real conversations. Something I mentioned a few weeks ago was like, you know, when people look at us and we're having these conversations or whatever it may be, or you've written your book, they think you're so perfect. I can't be Angela. I can't be Kino. But yes, you can. Oh, you know, yeah. we're just as human as you. We also make mistakes. We of also course. have, you know, uh, interruptions while recordings are happening. You know what happens. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, so like I just, you know, and like I'm one of those guys who like, you know, I want to show people that, you know, even though I can be here having this conversation, having a podcast, I'm assuming if you, you want to do it, you can also. Maybe there's a topic you're concerned about. Get on there, you know, yeah. and do it. You know, mm -hmm. perfect as you move along. That's what I, that's my slogan in life. Perfect as you move along. If you're passionate about something, start it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Start it, see what's next. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. But okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. All right. And Thank yeah. you very much. Have a beautiful Bye. day. Thank you. you Thank too. you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.